most of us are aware of uh, what we call paradoxes, right? It, uh, the, the seeming things that have no resolution. It, uh, and with my personality and rather obnoxious sense of humor, I thought of some uh, ones that I'm not going to share with you. Uh, how's that? But I'll bet most of us can. Uh, one of the things, I mean, we, we have, especially when we're trying to mess with little kids' mind, we have such things as what came first, the chicken or the egg. Well, from the, 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 from the biblical point of view, that one's really simple. The chicken came first because God made them that way. Uh, you know, but from an unsafe point of view, that is a paradox because you can't have one without the other. So the best answer is which of them came first? Yes. Okay, but we come today to a, uh, a yeah, I, I guess one of those paradoxes, perhaps one that we are a little more familiar with, is uh, the immovable object and the irresistible force. Okay. Uh, how, what happens when you uh, match up uh, an irresistible force with an immovable object? And again, those are the type of things we call paradoxes. Uh, we find today, as we uh, look at the first portion of John chapter 5, and the, pa the, the I should say the passage interrelates through the entire chapter, which is a whole lot more than uh, most of us even want to attempt to get through in one session. So we're going to look at it in segments, of course. Hopefully they'll make some sense to you. Uh, but what we find here in chapter 5 is uh, the, uh, the paradox of impotence. Impotence meaning that which has no potency, no power, no strength, okay? Strengthless versus omnipotence, okay? Meaning all-powerful or complete strength. When you have those two meet, you have, humanly speaking, a paradox. Okay? We're going to develop this. We find the setting in the first couple of verses of the Gospel of John, the chapter 5, where it tells us after this, after he'd been with the nobleman's son, okay, uh, and everything that went with, you know, with in Cana, uh, and all of the miraculous occurrence that we looked at last Lord's Day, just after this, there was a feast of the Jews. We have no idea for sure what feast it was. It has been suggested, uh, pa the Passover feast, but we don't know for certain. Not really important, or God would have recorded it for us. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. That's what he would have done as a, uh, a good Jewish man. You know, it was expected... Uh, that the heads of each Jewish household uh, would make at least the effort to get to Jerusalem or at least the local synagogue for the feast week uh, that was there. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, the word market is in italic, so it just says by the sheep, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Bethesda means house of mercy by the way, uh, it was near something indicated to have something to do with sheep. Uh, you find in the King James, again, they put the word market there. In other words, the translator supplied that, hoping it would give us a better understanding of how the wording of the text. Uh, it could have been the sheep gate. Okay, there is a sheep gate going around Jerusalem. It could also have been one of the numerous sheep markets uh, where inside the walls of Jerusalem for traveling uh, Jewish people that were going to give an offering, maybe a sheep, a goat, or so forth, could then purchase a, uh, an animal once they arrived rather than have to tote one of these things for hundreds of miles uh, to get there. Uh, and however you want to look at it, a little more about this pool that is there, it very clearly says there is a pool. Uh, if it is where it, uh, history tells us and archeology span uh, has proclaimed, uh, then it is what we have recognized historically and archeologically as the Pool of Bethesda. 
when Emily and I were there, it was mostly empty, had a little bit of water down at the bottom and so forth. Uh, this is a, a, basically it's two pools. Uh, you can still see the pillars on the sides, on the corners actually, and then a pillar in the center with a stub wall. Okay, which, you know, as far as we can tell, would have separated the two pools, okay, uh, it would have had a five column type of thing that supported the roof uh, that, you know, provided that over the top, uh, you know, so you have one pool that is comprised of two pools, you know, with a colonnade that supports a roof that shades good portions of the whole thing. Of course, the roof wasn't there. Uh, in our time, it has collapsed over the years and everything that goes with it. That's the geographical or, or physical setting uh, where the miracle that follows is going to take place. So here's the situation at the pool. Verse 3, in these, in these, on these porches, in these pools, because they, had, they got steps that go, the, the steps are angled and run all the way from way back down at a, at a, you know, kind of a moderate angle, but there are steps, and some of the steps are narrower and wider, but the steps run all the way to the bottom of the pool, okay? The pool is, I don't know, 18, 20 feet deep at the bottom. Uh, so you have this series of steps. You can literally walk down the steps until your hat floats. Okay, if the pool had water in it and the buoyancy wouldn't, you know, be a problem. Okay. Uh, so you have this picture now of, it tells us in verse 3, uh, that in these, in these pools, these, these multiple porch two-pool scenarios, there lay a great multitude of impotent folk. We're introduced to the folks lacking strength, impotency, okay? Uh, they were blind, halt, uh, meaning they couldn't walk, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled, stirred up the water. Whosoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man, I'm going to go ahead and read verse 5 for you, was there which had had an infirmity, a weakness, that was uh, 38 years. So his particular infirmity isn't specifically described. We can get a hint or two here in a moment as well. Now, there's textual controversy about this. If you have any uh, uh, sort of study Bible, you will find that there is going to be some type of an asterisk or a note or something that has to do with from the end of verse 3 uh, down, including all of verse 4, uh, most uh, uh, the earlier texts, I'll put it this way, uh, omit that particular passage. And it was, you know, there's some controversy. Does it belong? Does it not belong? And so forth. Some people say it's a myth. It was a scribal addition, a scribal error. Uh, and some people, have, those that include it, have tried to explain it in a number of different ways. This occasional stirring of water. Uh, some have suggested there was some type of a, uh, a subterranean action uh, that occasionally, kind of like Old Faithful in Yellowstone Park, caused some type of a, you know, up disruption of the water in the pool or so forth. Uh, some have said uh, that it's just a myth, pure and simple. Uh, you know, uh, some said that, uh, have said that well, it could have been a demonic disturbance in order to cause disruption in the spiritual life of the nation. Uh, one certainty I'm going to put forward rather boldly, and that it is not of God. Okay, it is not of God. Why can I say that with some certainty? Because it is not only arbitrary, it's very cruel. And that's not the character of our God. Okay. Also, if you think about it, this would mean that the strongest would prevail. Or someone who had the money to hire a man to stand right there, and if the water was troubled, to pick him up and get him into the water as fast as he could. 
Okay? Uh, this is not the way the biblical God operates. Okay? Uh, th this simply doesn't match up to what we know of the character of God as well. Now, if you jump down to verse 7, you're going to find, just for the moment, uh, that the impotent man, uh, in response to Christ, says, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am trying to get there, another beats me to it. Okay, that's a Hayden paraphrase. That's what it amounts to. Now, there's a couple of things here that tell you this was not just make-believe and not just a myth. Uh, if nothing else, we can say for, for, for certain the, the impotent man believed that he could get healed if he got into the water first. Okay? The second thing aspect is Jesus never mentions the whole troubling of the water thing in any way, shape, or form. He just doesn't, he just, it's not even an issue of what he's dealing with. So is it there? Is it not? Well, we can continue to debate that. The man, it tells us in verse 5, has had this infirmity for 38 years. Now, how long he'd been alongside the pool? No idea. Probably for at least a extended period of time, months or perhaps years at the least. Uh, uh, and we don't know what was his particular uh, problem. The Greek word there that talks about is asthenia. Uh, it has to do with a malady, a disease, or infirmity implying a totally total withering. I'm going to suggest the possibility, maybe even likelihood, is it either had something to do with his legs or perhaps his back. Because he needed, verse 7, uh, he needed a man to pick him up and help assist, get him into the pool. If it had been a withered arm, uh, he could have got himself into the pool without any great difficulty. Again, not really important as far as which which foot he had gout in or whatever the problem was. I have no idea. Uh, it's not the issue, is it? But have you stopped and thought here, this great multitude of impotent folk, impotent mankind, mankind, completely incapable of helping himself. We see a physical picture of what spiritually we see all around us in the world that we live in. Been going on now for century upon century. Mankind incapable of helping himself. Here pictured in a physical realm, but is that not true spiritually? Keep your finger there and go to the book of Romans, if you would, the fifth chapter. And we'll read a few verses that the apostle Paul presents. Uh, from the inspired passage of what God has provided. Romans chapter 5 in verse 6 says, For when we were, in other words, mankind before Christ, is when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. When we were without strength, we were impotent. We had no strength. We had no ability to take care of the spiritual problem. Uh, you see, keep your don't don't go away from there. But you have a picture in John chapter five of weak, sick, blind, lame, ailing, and impotent. All you have to do is think of those terms in a spiritual perspective, and you certainly see the plight of mankind. But you see also the solution of God. The plight of mankind, of course, is impotence. No strength, no power, no ability to do anything. It's kind of like Humpty Dumpty laying shattered at the base of the wall. Okay? Everybody sees the problem. Everybody recognizes the issue. But regardless of human effort, all the king's horses and all the king's men can't fix Humpty. Okay? Spiritually speaking, though it's just a child's nursery, 
rhyme that's a kind of the picture that you see here as well and we see then in Romans chapter 5 that we were without strength and Christ died for those that were without God verse 8 says not only that but God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and verse 10 kind of finishes us off so to speak if we think we're somehow worthy in and of ourselves and it tells us that we were enemies of God we had no strength to fix the problem we were impotent without Christ in John chapter 5 turn the pages back and get your thumb out of the pole and you see the exact same thing facing this man now I've always found it interesting as well something that sometimes goes right by our notice that Jesus walking in through the sheep gate that day or past the sheep market and coming to the pool of Bethesda spoke and dealt and healed one man it says there was a whole crowd of impotent folk there were all kinds of people that apparently had some type of physical malady okay? but Jesus picked out the one okay? think on that maybe we'll come back to it in a, in a few moments as well okay? it, the, the man probably having been there for a period of time and again no idea for sure how long uh, but I expect that he would have been well known at least in the immediate area Somebody probably had to carry him or put him in a cart or something of, the, of a similar fashion to order to get him there and back to wherever he slept at night. Uh, somebody had to provide that service for him. Uh, we don't know, but he would have been seen and been recognizable and identifiable by quite a number of people, at least in that part of Jerusalem during that time he would have been kind of a, a reasonably well-known individual for having been there that long certainly his family friends and local or, or you know, immediate uh, group in the area that he lived he's been this way 38 years people are pretty used to the fact that this guy's a cripple they know who he is probably know something about him in a variety of ways so let's look then at the following and look at the question, the command, and the response that is in, in all part of this miraculous event, beginning in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, knew that he had been now a long time, so it's supplied in that case, okay, in italics, Jesus said to the man, do you desire to be made whole? The impotent man answered him and said, Sir, I, I have no man when the water is stirred to put me into the pool. And while I am trying to drag myself down there, or hobble down there, somebody else beats me to it. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, walk. Immediately, you would have the word instantly, the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And then there's almost a parenthetical little statement and it was the Sabbath day. Okay. That's Saturday, basically, for us. Sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. Okay. You have several things here that are going on, don't you? First off, in verse 6, you have omniscience. When Jesus saw him, he knew he'd been there a long time. It doesn't tell us how he knew that. Uh, he doesn't tell us whether he asked somebody how long the guy had been there. I doubt it. You're talking about God. You're talking about the second person of the Godhead. Jesus knew all about this man, knew everything we're going to see. He knows more about his past than this man is probably comfortable with here in a few moments. Jesus knew he'd been there many years in some form with this aff affliction that he had. So he gives him a question. Do you wish to be made well, healed, made whole? In its context, the man would have automatically, with a whole group of uh, afflicted people physically surrounding him, uh, waiting the stirring of the water and the 
hope uh, of some type of miraculous healing, uh, the context just shoves the physical right at us, doesn't it? Jesus said, do you wish to be cured of your affliction? Okay. Now, Jesus is interested in a lot more than just the man's withered physical state. Okay. But the miracles always teach spiritual truth. Uh, Jesus, again, didn't run through the crowd healing everybody one after one after one that was in that crowd. He, picked, he selected that one individual and came and addressed him. Do you wish to be made well? Notice that Christ initiated the event. It was Jesus who spoke to the man. Isn't this always true that we're drawn by gods uh, on <laughs> what? Uh, we're, we're drawn by God's sovereign election, first of all. And no man can come to the Father except to be drawn by him first, John 6, 44. Or even Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Uh, yeah, it's God who's doing the seeking. Uh, Romans tells us, quoting the Old Testament, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. God initiates. Man responds. Okay? Man, sometimes, with bad theology or a lack of understanding or just open you know, confusion in general, somehow thinks that he's the one that gets the job done. Uh -uh. That's, not, that's not a biblical understanding of what salvation is. But notice there is man's part that is laid out for us here. A response was required. There was human responsibility. If you drop down in the chapter to verse 24, you see the following. It's when Jesus that picks up, truly I say to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. A human response is required to the divine offer. The question, would you like to be made whole? It seems very simplistic to us, right? Like, is, is this a trick question? You know? Uh, you know? I mean, really. I mean, what, 38 years this guy's had this problem? And somebody comes by and says, uh, would you like to be made whole? Would you like to be able to walk and jump and bound on your own again? And it's like, is this candid camera? I mean, is this a, you know, I mean, this is this the question you wouldn't even think would be relevant. But a human response is required to the offer of God. Okay? That's the responsibility that is there. The man's complete inability is exposed. Okay? He says, I have no man to help. I have no man to help. Uh, and you think, wait a minute, didn't say anything about having a man. Okay? But is he mixing human works? Is he somehow thinking, if, if, if I just could maybe next time settle a little closer to the pool, you know, so I could just roll in real fast or something. Uh, or if somehow I could scrape up enough money to get somebody to just be right there, ready to just toss me right in real quick if the water got stirred. Well, that's kind of a mixing, uh, isn't it? A little bit. Uh, does God need? I mean, Jesus isn't even going to mess with the water. You do realize that, don't you? Jesus doesn't take the guy into the pool. Jesus doesn't stir up the water, whether that's bogus or not. You know, Jesus ignores the pool from this point forward. Okay? It, Jesus doesn't need the pool. Okay? No, Jesus doesn't need anything. Faith in Christ. Okay? Yes. Okay? Faith in the right object, the object that has the power. Jesus just ignores the pool full of water. Human responsibility as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. Yeah. Chapter 1, verse 12 of the book, Gospel of John. Yeah. 
men have to respond to the offer that's there. The offer that was made, would you like to be made whole? That's kind of a specific word you may not have in a different translation, but Jesus wasn't talking about a partial healing. He said, do you want to be completely cured of the affliction? Now, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that when a sinner receives Christ as their Savior, a new creation occurs. Now, that doesn't mean the outside body gets remade. It means you are a new creation in Christ. The spiritual relationship of being born from above. Remember what Jesus told in Nicodemus in chapter 3. He must be born from above, be born again from above. There was no perhaps, no alternate, no anything. He said you must have that spiritual birth. Well, perhaps this man had, uh, had his hope kind of that maybe if I could just get somebody to help me. I mean, for 38 years, this man has been making every human attempt he, he probably can. Can you blame him? Humanly, can you blame him? I mean, if there's any chance of a cure, would you not at least consider pursuing it? We have the same thing today in our own world, including inside of Christianity, you know, where there's a possibility of a cure for this or a possibility of a cure for the next thing or a possibility and you know, whether it's a, <laughs> excuse me, a proven medical fact or something that is not quite approved of by the FDA or whoever, you know, it's a on and on it goes. Man, that catches our attention, doesn't it? Did this man have his faith in the pool water being stirred? His faith in the help, the assistance of another human being to get him there? Mm. Can't hardly blame him, can we? The command we find in verse 8. Okay? Jesus said to him, Sir, or I'm sorry, rise up, rise, take up your bed and walk. Okay? There's three parts there, aren't there? You can make much about them. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Rise, take up your bed, walk, okay? You realize this is a totally sovereign act of healing by Jesus? This is pure omnipotence. Verse 7, the man admits he's completely impotent, without power, without strength. Jesus now creates a miracle. And... We have the record of the spoken word of what the command and the response was. The man has not given us any indication, has he, of any type of personal faith, except the hope that he can get into the water first. That's the only thing he's, at this point, he's done. Okay? Does that mean that there is no faith involved? I don't think that's a good conclusion. But let me explain that as we go. Jesus, in effect, put it this way. Do you wish to be healed? Then believe my, can, my command to rise, take up, and go. That seems to be a package that Jesus is offering. How did the healing work? Did the man have personal faith? Well, faith is only as good as the object of the faith. It, uh, he didn't even recognize Christ as the promised Messiah. You know, he, there's no indication he recognized Jesus in any way, shape, or form. He was just some guy that stopped and said, do you wish to be made whole? And the guy said, dumb question, of course I do, but I have no man to get me there, and so forth, everything that went with it. Why don't you turn, if you would, to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. well-known passage. It tells us in verse 8, by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice it is not faith that saves a man. It is God's grace that saves them. Faith is the 
connection that allows grace to become effectually operative. It is the grace of God that does the actual work that is there. In faith being the channel for God's grace to become effective. That's to put it the simple way. But faith in an object that does not have omnipotence will not heal the man at the well. We don't know for sure all the particulars of this guy, do we? But we know that this is God's gift being exercised. And I'm sorry, but it seems very likely that there would have had to have been faith to some level, though we're not certain, and I hesitate to proclaim a certain wedge of the pie, but it seems very likely there had to be some level of faith exercise or the man would have never bothered to even get up or attempt to get up. Would you? You know, 38 years of impotency and some guy says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And you go, yeah, right. There had to have been something. I'm not excluding the sovereign, you know, omnipotence of God. That's not it. I'm saying that God is not a divine rapist. He is not spiritually going to force somebody. In fact, you remember what Jesus told Nicodemus. This is the condemnation that men choose to walk in darkness rather than light. This man, I believe, most likely had to have exercised some type of faith in the command that Christ gave. Otherwise, there would have been no result. But we find in verse 9, it says, Immediately, instantly, the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked. Immediately, instantaneously, and complete. You see the picture of what is accomplished by God's grace when faith is exercised, when a sinner responds to God's command, you must be born again. Okay. Wow. You say, well, how about the process? Mm. In human terms, there is no process. It's instantaneous. And it's complete. It is complete. The word cured here, if you look in verse 10, and we'll get there in a moment, has, is in the perfect tense. That means it was an action done one time that has lasting results. Yeah. Yeah. Consider, by the way, what went on here, those of you that are, have anything to do with physical therapy. Okay. This man instantly got up, rolled up his mat that he was sleeping on, and walked. 38 years of atrophied muscles. Okay. Wow. I don't know. How long does it take after an injury that immobilizes an arm or a leg before you begin to lose muscle tone? 48, 72 hours? Something like that? I mean... You kids are indestructible, but us old geezers, you know, it, it takes a little more effort for us, okay? It doesn't take this 38 years. Wow. The man's commanded to respond, and he took up his bed and walked. There must have been some level of faith that I believe him, that he just got up and walked, didn't he? Yeah. That's the response that's there. How about the religious response? reaction. Well, let's look at verse 10 and following here real quickly. Actually, you know, we'll just read a few verses and give you an idea. The Jews, therefore, you can put church leaders here that work pretty good, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and etc. The Jews, therefore, said unto him that was cured, it's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to be carrying your bed. Apparently, he ran into him out on the boulevard going down the sidewalk. And he's, you can just imagine this guy. He's skipping along. 
He's having a grand time. He's just hopping along, bouncing. He looks like a little kid playing. What's that thing that you do with the with the jumping jack thing? You know, it's a uh, you know squares. You know, you draw them on the sidewalk and you hop left. Oh, right. Ah, yeah. See, you guys. It. Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, he's just like a grand. Uh, he's having a grand time, and and he gets flied down by the by the religious leaders and says, "What's going on? What are you doing with your bed?" A bed sees a rolled up kind of a reed mat, probably that big, that long, weighs 8, 10, 12 pounds at the most. He said, what are you doing? They confront him. He answers and says, he that made me whole, the same said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they ask, uh, what man is that which said this to you? And he that was healed didn't even know who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. They didn't even know Jesus by name. Or he may have known the name, but did not know him by sight. He hadn't put the face to the name. We've done that, haven't we? It happens at times. You know, you hear a name repeated several times, and then you actually are exposed to that person. You don't know who it is. And you go, I don't know who it is. Okay. And then you get the name and you think, well, that's kind of a disappointment. But you know, maybe you don't. I don't know. That's my, old, that's my sense of humor again. Watch out for that. Okay. It, uh, so verse 14 goes on and says, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you are made whole. Don't sin any more, lest a worse thing come upon you than being an invalid for 38 years. The man departed, told the Jews it was Jesus that had made him whole. Therefore, the Jews persecuted Jesus, sought to slay him because he'd done these things on the Sabbath day. Okay? You know, when confronted with the miraculous, there are always those that debate the issue, aren't there? It, uh, a sinner coming to Christ for spiritual salvation always produces those that deny and ridicule. Now, I was a little older before I was saved by the Lord's grace, and I can remember numerous, numerous of my family relatives uh, just thought that was the funniest thing in the world, that he'd got, done got religion. And, ah, well, just put up with it. It'll blow over six months or a year, and he'll be off doing something else. Yeah, ridicule, deny, you know, it's uh, nope, always there, isn't it? The Jews and the man, verses 10 through 13, the complaint was that you're carrying your bed. Now notice he's not talking about a king-sized waterbed complete <laughs> with bookcases and book. He's not, that's not what he's talking about. Yeah, you know, he's talking about an eight pound little mat thing in all probability. He's going down the street, you know, delighted. Uh, and the religious people interpreted that as carrying as work, carrying a burden. Okay? Jeremiah 17, 21 says, bear no burden on the Sabbath. You know, you, know, you, th you thought they'd have been overjoyed. Some of them at least probably knew this guy. He'd been laying around town for 38 years, more or less. You'd think they'd have got some report on him. Do you really think that after 38 years of impotency that this man would consider carrying a pallet as a burden? You'd have thought that even the religious people would have been overjoyed at the man's healing. No. No. Seems like they're looking to find fault, aren't they? The criticalness of religion. Their tradition and their particular interpretation of something like Jeremiah 17, 21 allowed them to bring a charge to accuse Jesus. You know, but of course, initially, the healed man didn't even know who Jesus was. Then Jesus, notice, once again, seeks out the man and tells him, sin no more. Now, don't jump to conclusions here. We have no idea whether the man's physical malady was a result of some sinful action or not. 
what Jesus does say is you need to control your life because worse things can happen to you than just being an impotent man laying alongside a pool for years and years and years. Had it been sin-related, we don't know. And ultimately, doesn't that prove true for unsaved people that hell awaits for people who don't turn from their sin? Yeah, it sure does. Then, of course, you've got the Jews and Jesus in verse 16. We're going to get into this in more detail next Lord's Day, if he wills. And essentially, they post a death warrant. They say, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we've got a wanted poster, dead or alive, preferably dead. It, uh, we want to take this Jesus guy out. You know, he uh, goes on in the passage we're going to find and says that the Sabbath was never made to have control of man. The Sabbath was created as a day of rest so that people would have the opportunity to reflect and worship and not be distracted by the work ethic that God had placed upon man all the way from the Garden of Eden. But religion, well, basically they do it this way. If he doesn't follow our rules, we'll kill him okay? in the ultimate sense. So let's connect a few things as we wrap it up. In chapter 1, you found that Jesus, the very first record in the first 17 verses or so, 18 verses, declared Jesus as being God. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, eternally God. Okay? At the wedding of in Cana, in chapter 2, you saw the creative power of Christ, the creative power that only God has when he turned the water into wine. With Nicodemus in the garden, you come face to face, as Nicodemus did, that religion is not the solution. You have to be born a second time, not just from an earthly mother, but you have to be born by a heavenly father. Okay? With the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, you found that personal, personal repentance and personal faith in Christ is mandatory. At the end of that chapter, you found the nobleman's son that declares that for God, distance is totally irrelevant. Divine power and ability has no boundaries whatsoever. Absolutely no boundaries. And then here at the pool of Bethesda, man's complete inability to heal himself isn't even a speed bump when it encounters the omnipotence of Christ's deity. You see, if you sometimes go back and connect the events in the Gospel of John, I believe it'll bring more richness than just plucking out one thing here and plucking another there. There is a flow where Christ is revealing himself as deity throughout the book. And that helps us understand because man is without strength. As the impotent man at the pool so clearly pictures in the spiritual realm, mankind can't fix himself. He's just like that big old busted up egg laying at the bottom of the wall. Okay? And all the king's horses, all a man's efforts and devices can't fix because he doesn't have any strength. He's impotent. The only thing that can fix him is omnipotence. That's what Jesus demonstrated. Father, thank you as we bow before you for the privilege of beginning this chapter in the 5th of John. Lord, that we might recognize more completely our Lord as indeed God in the flesh, visiting his creation, displaying the wonder of who he is and was. Lord, and as we move on in the book, we'll begin to see more fully, more completely, and more richly 
the illustrations of that very truth. In Christ's name, amen.